disability rights, law, and narratives. Lessons for rehab professionals from qualitative research with people with disabilities. Ravi Malhotra, Associate Professor, Faculty of Law, Common Law Section, University of Ottawa. And Morgan Rowe, Associate Lawyer, Raven, Cameron, Ballantyne, and Yazbek, LLP. Presented by the School of Rehabilitation Sciences, University of Ottawa, Research Seminar Series, April 26, 2016. Bonjour à tous et toutes, c'est un grand plaisir d'avoir l'opportunité de uh, participer ce jour-là, mais je vais continuer dans la langue anglaise si vous voulez poser des questions en français. Je vais uh, répondre comme je peux. Donc, OK, so uh, today I'm going to speak on, hopefully that made sense, finding a voice of their own, uh, exploring disability identity uh, and the articulation of disability rights through the narratives of young adults with physical disabilities, and here is uh, one of our copies of the book. Uh, you know, and uh, if uh, anybody's interested, I'm happy to give you more information. But what I think I'm going to do in my brief time is talk a little bit about the origins of the project, try to convince you a little bit about the importance of uh, the looking through uh, this qualitative approach to get the experience of disability rights, but I'm thinking uh, with this audience that uh, probably will be fairly, hopefully not a challenging task. Some people poo-poo all qualitative research or don't think it's real or, you know, but I, I think uh, if you're open-minded, you'll, uh, through some of the passages, you'll get the power of narrative. And so even though what this approach does is not font work, it's not statistically significant in that chi-square sense, I think it's still valuable and interesting, uh, even with a relatively small sample size. So in terms of background, uh, let me just start. I do tend to anticipate my slides. This is all about a project uh, involving mostly young adults with physical disabilities. It's a sample size of 12. That's why I'm referring to qualitative work. Nothing can be extrapolated in that chi-square sense. But, and I think it's only an OT, uh, you know, is very client-centered. I, I think there's, uh, I don't, you know, I don't come from that background, but I've used OTs, uh, you know, as a client. And so I, I think it's something that's very client-centered and uh, I think it's receptive to qualitative research. And in fact, the work I do, I think, overlaps with the work I've seen uh, in, in the OT profession. So by way of background, uh, you know, and I think this is probably already cool news, to, uh, to most of you, know, you've got the systemic marginalization of people with physical disabilities. And so, in terms of uh, our methodology, although we did do, we adapted a measure of grounded theory, and you know, if you read the book, you'll see our line-by-line -line analysis that we did, uh, primarily Morgan, uh, did to, uh, to develop our theory. We, one thing I should say at the outset is that we did not embrace those advocates of grounded theory. For anybody here who is a methodology aficionado, you know, wants, wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe about, about these things, we did not adopt the idea that we have no politics, that some grounded theory people advocate, that you go into it with a blank slate, you put all your beliefs aside, and all your, all your work, everything comes with the participants. We tried to give power to the participants. We, didn't, we don't claim to do participatory action research. We talked about that. We don't, uh, just because that, that annoys people, you know, we, we didn't go quite that far. Uh, but I want to say that we did embrace our own politics in doing our analysis, which is social model of disablement. So it's all, it's all about the social model, structural barriers being the primary problem. And you'll see that on this PowerPoint slide, people with disabilities experience diminished labor market participation, higher poverty rates, lower education levels, and it results in what my colleagues at Dalhousie Law School, uh, now retired, Professor Diane Buffier and Richard Devlin, who I believe is still active, referred to as dis-citizenship. So you can check out their book, uh, Critical Disability Theory, if you're interested, which I think is, uh, is very important and useful. So give you a little bit more background in terms of the methodology. So this originates in law and society research. We make no claim to originality in terms of method we did apply grounded theory, uh, but the original study was an American one, which uh, has largely been ignored in the disability studies literature. And I, I encourage you to take a look at 
called uh, Rates of Inclusion by Frank Munger and David Engel. And I think it's a really interesting study uh, with some flaws. Okay, and so, uh, so what they do, having infinitely more money uh, than, than I did at the outset, which is essentially no money, it's a tiny, tiny grant, particularly by health sciences standards, I think $5,000, $7,000, something essentially a drop in the bucket. I ended up with 12 participants. Munger and Engel had hundreds. Uh, and they had people with learning disabilities and physical disabilities. In our sample, we, we only sought out people with physical disabilities, but some people had, by coincidence, they happened to have other diagnostic categories, like uh, psychiatric conditions, and also uh, they also had uh, uh, learning disabilities as well, you know, so uh, in some cases. Uh, but, but I will say at the outset, one of the things that distinguishes our work from, say, medical sociology is that we don't produce an impairment table uh, at the end of our work. So th there is no place where you can say that this person has this condition or that condition. And I think that's because, you know, being advocates of the social model, we don't feel that saying someone has the label of CP, for example, cerebral palsy, is actually that useful in telling you anything particular about their life. It might tell you something, but it's probably more misleading than it's useful because the continuum is so wide ranging. And so we avoided having impairment tables and wanted their actual narratives, the life narratives, to speak for themselves. And so it captures lived experience, as you can see on the slides, to just possibilities of legal strategies or political reforms by giving voice to marginalized groups. And, and this methodology is increasingly used in law, uh, in feminist theory, critical race theory, and uh, GLBT or queer theory. Uh, but my understanding, and as I come to this as a legal scholar, is that it's also being increasingly used by more open-minded uh, people in, in health sciences, and certainly medical sociology, occupational therapy, although, I, again, I think, uh, I think it's more, con my impression is it's more controversial in the sciences because there's always this business of, uh, of what is statistically relevant. So, you know, we don't, uh, we don't worry about that. We draw certain conclusions. It's a sample size of 12, but we believe the, the life stories speak for themselves. And also, because our audience is general, from the legal literature, and I think that applies mutatis, mutatis, I think in health sciences, is life stories are particularly cogent and relevant where the general public doesn't understand the issue. Okay, so the canonical example would be the transformation of sexual harassment law. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with this, people like Kathleen McKinnon and my, my learned colleague Constance Backhaus at the Faculty of Law here in Canada, is pioneering work on sexual harassment. Uh, and if you're younger, so some of you are younger in the audience, uh, th this example might not, not actually make sense to you. But I mean, the, the, so there's a, there was a discursive shift in sexual harassment law, and life stories and narrative methodology uh, played a huge role, I would argue, in making that shift from a 1950s mindset where the questions you asked were, what was she wearing? What did she say? You know, what, what was her, uh, was she of chaste character? I mean, even the questions are, are kind of shocking for, from a 21st century perspective. People don't generally think in that. There's a, so it's a paradigm shift, but because you've gone through it, you don't think about it. There was that shift to sexual harassment law today, and late narratives played a big role in that. We would argue, and I think we do argue successfully in the book, that many of the disability experiences are as are unknown in the, today in the same way that uh, sexual harassment uh, wasn't known. So when I say it wasn't known, there was no language. So feminists had to create a language around sexual harassment. They actually had to create the term. There, there wasn't sexual harassment. So like my, my mother who passed away, she would always talk about unwed mothers. There was a, there was a shift. And, and when, when you hear that term, that, that term is, it's, it's the very 1950s, kind of she was in her 80s. But you know, there was a shift from unwed mothers to, you know, to feminist conceptions of motherhood. That, that was just, the, the very terminology had to be invented, if, if you follow what I'm saying. And the same concepts apply in disability rights. Uh, and so the, the paradigmatic example I would give to you is attendant services. Now, because, and I'm not sure what the, who the audience is, I'm assuming many of you are in OT or a related field, uh, that may not, that may not fit well with you. But for the general public, which is our audience, uh, I think a lot, a lot of the politics behind occupational therapy, excuse me, uh, behind attendance services, 
although known in occupational therapy, probably not well known to the public. So the conflicts, for example, between unionized workers uh, and attendance service uh, client, for example, which, which is a raging controversy in this is just an example, all the politics around gender choice and attendance services, you know, there's a range of issues around it, and many of our, our participants in our study were people who used attendance services, and so, so it's just one illustration of how uh, you could talk about uh, these issues. Okay, so moving on to the next. So I think I've, I've mentioned some of this already. We had in-depth qualitative one to two hour interviews with mostly young adults. Though everyone was a student, they all had physical disabilities. A few of our participants were older uh, people. So older in this context means over 24. Just, just you know, uh, it's, uh, you know it's, uh, that's what it is. So uh, it was conducted by me and my research assistants, and Ms. Rowe was brought on later in the project. And uh, you know, you know at some, if there's time, I'll talk about the politics collaboration. But if you're wondering, no, law is not this weird discipline. It's, it's very unusual what I did in terms of bringing, uh, Ms. Rowe was then a student, now gone on to be a successful lawyer. That was an unusual collaboration, but it was enormously successful uh, because she was able to bring insights uh, and was a full, fully cooperative, fully collaborative co-author in the work. Uh, and we received nothing but support from Rutledge, the publisher, and from, uh, from two deans. Uh, at the Faculty of Law in this uh, unusual collaboration, but I, I think it was a giant success. In Egypt. I also praise Morgan, but she's I think, usually embarrassed. Yeah. So, it's gonna, so maybe I won't. Yeah. No, it's just, I mean, it, I guess the point is it, it would not, I don't propose this in 99% of cases. You have to pick the right student for it to work. Ms. Rowe happened to be the best student I've ever had. And, uh, but yes, yeah, she, she sees it, you know, it's, it's not work. She usually blushes at this point. So, I'll, I'll, you know, so uh, as I said, uh, we used a late narrative methodology. I don't call it participatory action research because we I don't think we met every criteria for part. We did give transcripts to participants, but you know, in many cases there wasn't a lot of feedback. Some people wanted to move on. And I participated, by the way, in my own as a participant in another research study, and uh, I was offered uh, I'm still waiting for the check, but I was I was offered uh, two hundred dollars to uh, to participate. In the study, and you know, and that's fine if that they cleared it with their research efforts. But I'm just a participant. All of which to say is, though, that if you, uh, the more you give, at some point, it, it it starts to raise. I say this as someone who has served on uh, on a hospital research ethics board. Although my my days are thankfully over. I, I I did serve on a research ethics board. When you're giving that kind of money, it raises questions. In our study, we offered very little money, and I, you know, I think that affects how much people are going to do, but. I'm, as a researcher, I'm more comfortable with that model. And you know, when you start offering people two hundred dollars, you know, kind of, uh, as opposed to say ten dollars, I, I think it makes a real difference. You know, people are more willing. To, it, it, it starts to raise issues around consent, but it means we do have this limitation in, in what people will do. So, uh, let's move on. So I think, yeah, I think I've said mostly what's on the slide. So the, it, our work bears some similarities. To participatory action research, but uh, you know I don't think it's uh, it's identical. So basically, the core finding of uh, rates of inclusion is that there's a recursive relationship between rates and identity. They're mutually constitutive and contingent. So the acquisition of a disability identity can facilitate contexts in which rates become active, but the emergence of rates can also facilitate the growth of a disability identity. And I don't know if that's completely clear when I, when I say it's recursive. So you have to understand in Munger and Engel's study, which we replicated here, none of the people in his large study had ever litigated. But the very existence of the Americans with Disabilities Act transformed how they saw themselves and how they advocated. So that in itself is an interesting finding, right? The whole idea that there's this recursive relationship. And so they, the very existence of rights changed identities, but <clears throat> their identities also changed the way they articulated rights. Uh, and as I said, they, theirs was a much larger sample. There are some really uh, problematic aspects of Munger and study, which we uh, certainly have communicated to them. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, well, anyway, I mean, uh, the, you have to, they do not come to this 
for, as disability scholars. So there, this may make more sense to this audience and others. They, uh, I think that the work they're doing is landmark. I think the methodology is important, and we replicate it here because I think the core ideas are extremely interesting. If they are using Goffman, uh, unreconstructed from the 60s. It's as if they never read anything in the field of psychology after Goffman around 1965, which is uh, troubling in some, you know, but they're not, they're not psychologists, or right? they don't come to it. So one of the findings they keep having is that they see the successful people, people that we would say are, that look at as people who understood the social model. That's how, that's how we would look at it. They use the spoilt concept from Goffman, say that their identities were not spoiled, and other, basically other people spent too much time feeling sorry for themselves. I mean, they, 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 they replicate this unreconstructed Goffman aspect in their work from stigma, uh, and so which we just basically dropped. And so in our approach, we took on the social model uh, to court, you could say. And so, uh, you know, going on to the next one. Rates and identity. So, and this is just repeating things I've already said. The enactment of disability rights laws can transform individual self perception as private troubles become public problems. And that speaks to the sexual harassment illustration uh, that I use. So, the analogy for disability rights, I, I gave the example of attendance services. Politicizing attendance services uh, is something that's unfamiliar to most people, right? Like the whole issues around attendant services or constructing your day so that you can manage paratransit bookings and attendant services bookings may be familiar to the OT world, but is unfamiliar, I think, to most people. And it has a number of political dimensions and, frankly, legal issues around attendant services. You know, uh, the enactment of disability rights laws spawns cultural shifts that transforms how others regard people with disabilities. So a paradigmatic example there uh, in the American context would be Franklin Roosevelt, for example, the whole way people with polio were regarded, not so much in Canada, and, uh, you know, but there are, uh, although uh, certainly disability society there, and I think that's really by an OT, there, there is some literature uh, in disability society about the lost earlier generation of Canadian disability rights advocates. Uh, the main thing is, though, it, it really, I mean, that, that's a whole other discussion. I, I can leave to another time, but comparative work, that's sort of my hobby course, so I won't get off on basically Canada did have enough wars, is, is what it was. The, the US had lots of wars, so you, like Vietnam, Korea, so you had lots and lots of disabled people. They uh, kept refurbishing the disability movement. Canada has no wars, and so you have this polio outbreak, and you have a little bit of Korea, but you have this long gap because there is no Vietnam till the 70s. That, that's, that's the short answer in case anybody's interested. Uh, and finally, rates may generate institutional transformations. And you can see that in the growth of, say, disability offices at university campuses. And, you know, there's a variety of examples that I could use. So I think the next, how am I doing for time? You're at uh, your 20 in one minute. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I'm glad I asked that. That's, uh, <laughs> that was my little wave. I was trying to say that for 15. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I didn't, okay. That's my bad. Okay, so we've got one minute. I think I've largely said everything on the method. I've already said. Uh, most of this, we did have focus groups, and again, I think I'm speaking to a highly sophisticated audience. You know, this was a project I did early in my career, so I didn't, uh, I didn't necessarily follow all of the principles of power, as I said before. So, for example, I, uh, I did focus groups later, and I'm well aware in the literature that many people advise you should do your focus groups at the beginning, have them construct questions. That's not why I don't call this power, because we certainly came into it with ideas, but there's no censorship. There's no, this is not fiction writing. Some of the more post-structuralist people invent narratives. There's nothing like that here. This is, it comes from the audience. We took their ideas and many of the conclusions, hopefully there'll be time uh, to discuss. Uh, I think Ms. Rowe will talk about some of them in the education context. There's time for everything. It comes from the ideas of the participants. But, uh, but we, did, we did do focus groups for men and women uh, later on, and our main recruitment agency was uh, disability uh, service offices, although we did try a number of other things. So there were seven men and five women. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time on diagnostics, but for this audience, you know, you may be interested to know conditions included CP, spina bifida, and people injured in uh, motor vehicle accidents, but many also had conditions that we weren't screening for, psychiatric learning disabilities. And I think we lived up, maybe I'll conclude by this and turn it over, 
to Ms. Rowe, we did live up, I think, to the open-ended narrative approach because I'm a labor law scholar. And, and so they would talk about things that we never even asked about, like pseudo topics I'm allergic to, like sexuality, for example. No, not interested in, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond the scope of what I do, uh, but they talked about it anyway. So, uh, and so we were able to have a gender chapter, and Ms. Rowe uh, was, was enormously useful in, in having, uh, contributing things that I couldn't have, have done on my own as a labor scholar. It is a relatively privileged group. We did not include long-term ODSP recipients that, that are not students, and uh, nor did we include full-time workers. So it's, it's a particular sample. There were a couple of older ones, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they, they, had a, they had an incredible amount of life experience and uh, I'm just gonna, yeah, I think this, this really just repeats. So I, I think that might be, the, this is probably a good point to turn it over to Ms. Rowe, uh, who's gonna talk in more detail about some of the findings uh, for the second half, or, and I can, uh, I, oh, did I drop the, oh, it's a brush, like, it's a lot. I'll turn it over, enjoy some more of your cookies, and, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what I'm going to do, I think, now that uh, Professor Malhotra has given something of an overview of sort of what the study was about, how we went about it, what the purpose of doing the study in the first place was, what I'm going to do is unpack one of the chapters we wrote about, because our chapters were themed around uh, essentially topics that came up a lot in these interviews that we were doing. And so we have one chapter on education, one chapter on employment, a chapter on transportation, and chapter on gender as being sort of the predominant themes that arose out of these uh, interviews as we were carrying forward. So I'm going to speak about education kind of as an example of the work we were doing and uh, what came out of our work. Now, Professor Malhotra had been talking a bit about this recursive relationship between rights and disability identity. And one of the things that we found when we were doing this study again is that there's a similar recursive relationship um, in our participants. When they're talking about their experiences as individuals with disabilities and how they see themselves in the relation to the, the world around them, they don't usually use law language, but they will use rights language. So it's very much about what's fair, what's right, what's not right. Um, and the same thing happens when they're talking about what they see as their entitlements when they're interacting with a school setting, for example. A lot of it is about um, how they see themselves as a person and how they see themselves as being uh, treated by others around them and perceived by others around them. So a lot of these life narrative stories bleed into stories about experiences with rights, even though none of our participants actually, well, one of our participants reported having engaged in a legal process, but none of the rest of them so what we spend a lot of time actually talking about in the book is this idea of advocacy experiences. Because what we found was that for a lot of participants, the place where rights and identity meet and interact is when you have to advocate on behalf of yourself. And when we say advocacy, we see we don't really mean it in a legal sense. We don't mean it in the sense of what lawyers like me do. We mean it more in an informal sense, in the informal processes that people have to engage in when they're an individual with a disability who needs accommodation in a school setting or in a transportation setting or what have you, and they can't get it without taking kind of some kinds of steps on their own. And so what we found, I think, ultimately coming out of all of this is a repeated sense, a repeated sort of plea from these participants that process isn't as important as results. That the process we go through to seek accommodations, to engage individuals with disabilities in accommodation processes can matter as much to these people and to their sense of identity and for their sense of being fairly treated as actually coming out with an accommodation at the end of the day. And so I'll give some examples from the education chapter to see how that sense and that um, idea was communicated to us. So just to give a bit of background about education and disability in Canada. Um, historically, like most Western countries, Canada adopted a policy of segregation where individuals with disabilities were placed in special school settings and cut off from what we would consider the normal or regular population, regular classrooms. Um, students with disabilities were largely seen as needing protection, as needing to be sort of insulated from a hostile world around them. And also from, uh, there was an assumption made that people with disabilities would not be able to 
excel or even meet expectations in a regular school setting. Just across the board, if you have a disability, you're not going to be able to meet the standards of regular school systems. Therefore, we're going to segregate you. And in roughly the 1970s and 1980s, at around the time when we were going through a big upheaval in our human rights law in Canada in general, we were repatriating our constitution, we were introducing the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is now in our constitution. Uh, there was a shift in education um, through the introduction of legislation that actually specifically required schools to provide educational services to students with disabilities. This did not actually exist prior to the 1970s and 1980s. And then in 1997, approximately, we have a, a landmark decision come out of the Supreme Court called Eaton, uh, in which the Supreme Court rejected, actually, um, arguments that had been made saying we should presume inclusion unless a student really needs to be in a segregated setting. We should always assume that they should be in an integrated or inclusive setting. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 we're not going to accept any kind of presumption. Everybody needs to be assessed based on their own needs and on their own um, you know, merits, essentially. Everybody needs to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. We can't operate on presumptions because that's treating everyone as though they're some sort of blanket that can be assessed universally. Um, and what's interesting for us then is speaking with the participants, a lot of their early experiences with advocacy and a lot of the times that they recount having to first really assert uh, disability identity is in this context of integration versus segregation. So despite the fact that we're dealing with fairly young participants, you know, participants who were probably born largely in the 80s, we still have this debate uh, that's their first earliest childhood memory about having to advocate for inclusion and for accommodation. And so we had a number of participants who spoke about the fact that their parents had had to advocate on their behalf when they were going into kindergarten to ensure that they ended up in an inclusive setting rather than a segregated setting. And specifically, one of our participants, who we call Tom, tells a story. And this is an individual who only has a mobility disability. Um, but he states, so they wanted to put me in the special needs class, and my mother stood up and said to the school board very angrily that I was perfectly fine. I was as intellectual as any four-year-old and as capable as any four-year-old or five-year-old being in the integrated classroom. All I needed was an educational assistant to basically be my arms and legs. So eventually, after a couple of what she says were grueling meetings with people who don't know what they're talking about at the school boards, she was able to get me into a fully integrated classroom. Because the issue that Tom was facing was that because he had a fairly obvious mobility disability, and because he was a quiet, reserved child, the school board had automatically assumed that he was not going to be capable mentally and intellectually of participating in a regular classroom. And his mother had to fight on his behalf to prove them wrong and to make sure that he got an educational experience which was actually going to meet his needs and his abilities. Um, and what we say here at the, at the bottom I think is a very telling point that when you're a young kid and your parent is your main advocate, the ability of that parent to spare the time to be able to go to these meetings, to be able to take time off work, to have even like the emotional and psychological resources to do that on behalf of your kid, makes a huge difference to both, we found, how you develop um, a sense of advocacy yourself and the importance of advocacy, but also in terms of what actually happens to you as a kid and where you end up. Um, we had another participant, Nancy, who was in a very financially precarious home as a child and who was raised by a single mother who did not have the resources to do this. And as a result, she ended up in segregated schools for most of her uh, young life, despite the fact that she had a very similar set of medical conditions to Tom. Uh, and actually came out of it, I mean, we can't draw, because it's not quantitative research, it is qualitative research, we can't draw solid conclusions, but Nancy's reaction in later life as well to problems and difficulties arising in school settings was often to give up. When she had classes that she couldn't make because there was a distance between the classes that she couldn't cross, or when the school setting was not a, uh, adapted to her mobility needs, she would often just drop the class and say, what can I do? And obviously we can't draw any kind of firm correlation from those things, but it was an interesting observation that these two people who had such different formative experiences about advocacy went on to embrace advocacy in very different ways in their later life as well. Though interestingly, Nancy is the participant who has sued someone in a legal form as well, so hard to say exactly what, what that means. Um, 
what our, what our participants also talked about a lot um, was the idea of attitudinal barriers being the most difficult to overcome. Obviously, when we're thinking about mobility disabilities, we think about ramps, we think about small doorways, we think about physical barriers. But what the participants told us was actually these attitude barriers were more difficult to overcome, A, but also more damaging because they reflected more of a, purchase, a personal assessment of the individual, and the individual took it more personally as well. It became part of their narrative of who they were, that they were being treated this way and seen this way by someone else. And so in a lot of situations when encountering these kinds of stereotypical attitudes, they found that they were frustrated because they were excluded from processes or because their explanation of what their needs were weren't taken as serious or as um, based in evidence. They found often that they were treated very paternalistically, that in, especially in school settings, that the school often acted as though it knew best, despite not being the one who was experiencing the barriers that the individual was experiencing. Um, and all of these things, these reflections that these individuals found that these attitude barriers had on, on them as a person that they weren't worth making efforts to change for, that they shouldn't be involved in this process, this was a process that was going to come from top down, hurt them much more than not being able to get into a washroom because there was no button on the door. That was just a physical thing that happened that was affecting everyone who was in that building as opposed to a, a value judgment about the person. And one of our participants, Lisa, I think said this best when she was commenting on the perennial problems she was having with broken elevators in her high school because she found that actually manageable. It wasn't great, obviously. She would have classes on higher up floors that she couldn't get to or that she had to walk to. Um, and she went through this whole rigmarole with a test where she was required to climb up and down stairs repeatedly to prove that she could safely walk upstairs um, that she found extremely humiliating and that was massively inappropriate and not a particularly good test either because she would never have been required to go up and down stairs. She would have gone up, stayed in class, and then come down. Um, but she said, you know, I can handle that. That's fine. It's when, for example, uh, teachers refuse to recognize that an educational assistant or an educational attendant is there to help me with my accommodations and is instead assigning this person to go off and do photocopying or to help other students who need help. That's when I start to feel like what, what my needs are aren't really being taken account of and aren't being treated seriously. And so what she says is about the uh, broken elevator issue, it was all sort of big wide school issues that had an effect on me and had negative effects on me. But I knew that it was nothing that I personally did and it wasn't necessarily a vendetta against me. So the sorrow of the depression that I would feel because the elevator constantly broke was not the same as being left in the bathroom for two hours during fire drills because no one cared. So that was the solution that the school came up with when she couldn't get down during fire drills because the elevator was broken. She was asked to wait in the bathroom until someone could come get her and bring her down, which, sure, fine in a drill, maybe, although raises serious questions about how seriously that school was treating her safety, but had there ever been an actual fire, you can imagine just how serious that problem would have gotten. So Lisa tells a lot of stories about her school experiences because school was something that was very important to her and ultimately a very positive experience. She tell, told us near the end of her interview that she wants to go on to be a teacher herself. Um, but what she says is that a lot of teachers she encountered freaked out the second she said the word accommodation. And then a lot of it was because they weren't, they didn't totally understand what that meant and they didn't understand what that would mean for them in their classrooms, what they were gonna have to change. They think that they were gonna have to change any, everything. But she also found that as soon as they got into this mindset of, okay, I've got to accommodate, I've got to do accommodation, they stopped listening to her. And as a result, what would happen is they'd end up with accommodations that didn't really make sense for her, or they would fix something for a little while, and then they'd go back to doing it wrong again. And the educational assistant is a, a good example of that, because she would you know, bring up the fact that you know, my, my educational assistant probably shouldn't be asked to go off and laminate things while I'm taking tests, and it would be better for a little while, but then it would go back to the way it was before. And a lot of the participants talk about a similar thing in relation to physical barriers, because 
they found that the exclusion of people with disabilities from the accommodation processes, from talking about accommodation and what accommodations people with disabilities actually needed, meant that physical accommodations often didn't make a lot of sense either. You would have ramps that led to hallways going to uh, professors' offices, but the door had no button on it. So you'd be able to get up the ramp to the door, but then you'd have no way of opening the door. Or you'd have bathrooms where a similar thing, there'd be accessible stalls in the bathroom, but there'd be no button to open the bathroom door. And these individuals would be told, you know, we've made accommodations for you, what's the problem? And they'd try to explain, you know, it's great that I have a washroom stall when I get into the washroom, but if I can't get into the washroom, or if I have to go down three flights to find a washroom I can get into, that doesn't actually solve the problem. And indeed, one of our participants ran into a very strange problem where she was actually asked to choose between what disability she wanted to have accommodated. Because she was in a situation where she had both severe food allergies and, um, and mobility issues, so she was in a wheelchair. And she was told in coming into residence, essentially you can be in a residence where we'll have a food plan that meets your food restrictions and, and meets your uh, allergy requirements, but there are no accessible rooms in that residence, so you get to choose. Food allergies or actually being able to get into your room. And this is the kind of thing that these participants faced a lot. Like they would be, another individual, um, one of our male participants talked a lot about how he had difficulties with the programs that were being recommended to allow him to type. Because they were giving him things like Dragon, things that are meant to deal with um, people who either can't type or can't see or, you know, for whatever reason can't write papers, essentially, in English. But he was a programmer. That was his field of study, computer science. So the program that they were trying to recommend to him, the only program that he was given, being given as an option, wouldn't have actually let him do the thing that he was at school to do. And so all of this, I think, comes down back to the idea that I was started off with, which is this idea of, Results are important, yes, obviously. Accommodation, if, it, if you know, an accommodation measure doesn't get implemented, it doesn't get implemented in a way that makes sense, then obviously an individual is excluded from whatever it is that they're trying to participate in, whether it's education or whether it's the other kinds of uh, topics we look at in the book, employment, transportation, what have you. But process is important as well, because what these individuals said is this experience is exhausting. Having to do this every day it's exhausting. And then having the process go so wrong, having it not make sense just because people aren't listening to us, um, makes it not only exhausting but frustrating. And it makes us feel devalued even if we get what we want out of the process. We are being excluded, essentially, by the process itself, even if we're accommodated at the end of the day. And what we saw then is that the participants often, even when they would have a legitimate rights issue, an issue where they, where they could come to someone like me and say, I'm being discriminated against as a lawyer, what do you recommend, would find ways to avoid having to advocate just because the advocacy process is so unpleasant. And I think when you are dealing with the kind of results that we were coming up with in this study where, um, where you see that rights and how you feel about rights and how you feel about advocacy ultimately impact how you feel about yourself as a person with a disability, this becomes an even more important issue to address because if the processes that we're using to try and accommodate people, to try and help people with the structural barriers the rest of society is creating around them, make them feel worse about who they are as people, then we're doing something wrong. That being said, to end on sort of a positive note to wrap up what the education chapter was all about on a positive note, I think the flip side of this point that attitudinal stuff is the most, the hardest to deal with for, for people with disabilities, um, the flip side of it is that when you encounter people who get it and who, or who don't get it and are willing to admit that they don't get it and who are open to having you participate in the process and to really hearing your voice and to doing something proactively to accommodate you, then it can be pretty transformative. And both our participant, Sarah, and our participant, Lisa, talked about teachers and professors in their lives who had been that person, who had essentially come to them and said, 
I know nothing about accommodation. I know nothing about your medical condition. Just tell me what to do. And sat down and had a discussion with them. And then took that discussion and actually put it into practice. And they said, these people are the best. They, they change, they can actually change our lives. And, and indeed, Lisa, as I said, who wants to be a teacher now, credits her two teachers in high school, who she said were, came to her with this kind of approach as being her inspirations for wanting to be a teacher because she wants to be that person for someone else someday. And so I think, you know, we have the capacity, we have the ability as a society, as people who inevitably in our lives at some point are going to be engaged in accommodation discussions with someone. Um, certainly in the field that you all are in, that's pretty inevitable. Um, to, we have the capacity to do this in a way that makes sense, in a way that's respectful, in a way that treats individuals with disabilities as participants in this process, not as the, only the beneficiaries of the process. And I think if we can do that, what Sarah and Lisa and the other participants say is it makes a world of difference. So if anything comes out of this book, I hope you take that message away because I think it was ultimately the conclusion we came to um, from what our participants were telling us. Thank you. Right on the button for the time. And we have a few minutes for questions. questions. Well, can we add another layer to the story and, and uh, um, think about people, well, maybe another project, uh, with communication disabilities uh, who are not able to talk about directly maybe talk about their own uh, issues um, and um, that there's a, there's a whole other uh, layer there because their the accommodations might be things like a longer doctor's appointment because you're using a communication device and that, that's not anywhere in any uh, accommodation or more time with the bank manager and it's not necessarily about um, an actual change in something because it's the communication that's so slow that it makes it so it's a, it's a time, like a time issue. That's one thing that comes to mind. That's I mean that has actual a real practical reverberation for me because as someone who works with a lot of people with quite serious communication disabilities among other things. And as someone who bills at an hourly rate for my services, right? It's a very real question that I have to deal with when I'm meeting with people. And, and who, whose responsibility is that? I mean, exactly. It can't necessarily be yours, but it sure isn't the, the individual. No, they shouldn't time. be penalized for the fact that they have to take more time right. to get the same service from me. I agree. I'm working on a question. <laughs> Since I don't know about the characteristic of this participant, but I don't know through their life experiences, did you feel or did you find or at least feel that culture or ethnic background may affect or considered as additional barrier? I'm going to throw that one to Ravi since he actually participated in the yeah. 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 No, there are two things that I, I regret about the study. One, as I said, it's a study I did very early in my career. Uh, we did not ask direct questions, I think maybe except in focus groups about anything related to either race or sexual orientation or identity. So those things are people are interested. I have no real excuse for, the, for, for race, I thought that if it was important to them it would come out naturally, uh, but frankly it didn't, and so I'm left at the end with ambiguity GLBT rates. Uh, I think that I just, I. Again, I thought that people that wanted to would talk about it. Uh, and I think that came out a little bit in focus groups when we clued in, we better get, or I should get on it. Uh, but but it, uh, if I could just uh, say something about the earlier point, though. Uh, the other one, it's interesting because I think that issue arises also, and I say this starting from the premise that law and OT are actually quite similar, all the allied health professionals, in that you all have regulatory colleges I think that's something that the law society need, needs to consider in, in terms of a rules of personal conduct. Archibald Kaiser, who's a professor at Dalhousie, about a year ago just came out with a law review article about ethical responsibilities of lawyers in light of Canada's ratification of the Convention of the Rights 
of persons with disabilities, which you know I think every lawyer uh, frankly should read. But I would suggest that that same Kaiser's piece probably applies to every profession that has a professional college. That that all the, which definitely applies to to Kodo and to, to other. I think that the professional colleges in the health sciences, like there, there's a number of them, have to start looking at what the CRPD means in terms of their ethical responsibilities for clinic, not just in the communication, but also accessibility just in general. I think there's a, a, range, a range of issues that, that have come up. I just wanted to put that up. Yeah, people interested that Archibald Kaiser has done this work for, for the legal profession. Question, but I know the time is going by, so I might as well get it out there. <laughs> um, I was just wondering when we talk about whose responsibility is it? Is it the system or is it the people? Especially for the attitudinal barrier, right? Who's who's who are you supposed to go and and, and, and approach to change that? Yeah, Rafi, do you have? In terms of uh, system, well, I don't know that it's one or the other. I mean, I think it, you know, it's it's going it? to it's going to depend on the context, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think. Uh, you know, it really depends on what kind of issue you're dealing with and what, what the person wants to do. Some people want X, so they want, they're not interested in the long term. From lawyers deal with an issue all the time, that's what strategic litigation is all about. Are they interested in a quick fix? Often in a legal context, you're talking about settlement then. But if, if you don't settle, then you, can, you have the potential to make transformative change. I, I just settled my own personal case against my own union union that wasn't accessible and you know had a building that wasn't accessible we settled you know and some people would say don't settle and you know but if people are offering me a settlement you know I, as someone inside the system i know enough that that you should always settle because <laughs> you know the, like, but some people have really want i mean it's a huge challenge if you don't settle not in my kind of case but you've got a systemic case you are talking, and I'm sure Ms. Rowe would agree, but you're talking about going to the Supreme Court of Canada or any court, you're talking about many years before, and a person, uh, whether they're disabled or not, has to be prepared for a battle that will be five years, probably longer, if you're going to the Supreme Court of Canada. You're talking about a, a very long time, and so is that worth it in terms of, you know, changing structures, maybe you can reach a... Simpler solution. I, I think that each individual. But the, but the individual solutions didn't work for a lot of these people. Like the yeah. button for the elevator. Who, who's, who should have done that? Was it the yeah. teachers should have done that? The, yeah. the I think it's both. Well, Was it the system yeah. that didn't follow the, the, the right for everybody? I don't know. I think it, it, you need some incremental change. You need some systemic. I don't, I don't think it's one or the other. But yeah, I think that's probably true. And I think it comes back to, to the point that <laughs> Professor Malhotra was making earlier about, uh, about life narratives, right? A story of one person involved in one fight against one institution becomes the impetus for a larger change when it hits something in our collective thought process and how we look at society that then changes how we look at things. So, you know, the Eaton case in 1997 too, right, which dealt with an individual who was nonverbal, who was being put into a segregated classroom and is now essentially the reason why we have um, a trend towards integrated classrooms in Canada. Um, you know, she was just fighting her school board and, you know, the, the teachers and the principal, for instance, who didn't want her in their schools. But it turned into something much broader that actually created social and, and institutional change. So I think, I think it goes back to like narratives for me, and I'm, but I say that as a lawyer and journalist. So that's always been sort of my way of trying to make those changes in society myself. I just have a methodological question because I, I think I missed something at the beginning. So you did focus groups afterwards, you said. So what were you doing beforehand? Beforehand? They would interview? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we did. Individual and, uh, interviews. Yeah. And I, I'm, not some, I'm not someone methodologically trained. I realized later that the, the ideal approach is to use focus groups to create the questions. But we, no, we I, had, I'm not the talkers. I just missed Yeah. yeah. No, we, we had an open-ended approach, though. So as I said, I, I never intended to have a chapter on gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was Ms. Rowe. Originally, I looked at this and I saw lots of women had experiences. I said, well, how are you write a chapter? But it, it was Morgan who came out with that actually, if you look at them in the right way, they were in all the interviews, including the men. It was just, it was harder to find. Mm -hmm. But it, the, the men implicitly 
talked about gender roles and masculinity. It's a lot more coded in the men's. Yeah. It's, it's a it's lot more explicit in the female interviews. Yeah. And it, I, I didn't pick up on that, but we had enough content, and Morgan had the right background. We had a gender chapter mm -hmm. that, that we were able, you know, I'm just, I'm not uh, well trained in those. It, but the, the combination meant that we were able to get a broader range. But no, we, we did our focus groups later. We, we did get some interesting information. So I think on one of the PowerPoint slides, the, uh, the, the policy conclusion that we should have uh, people, the educational system, tied to the prison. So the prison disability is in every year training in EA, who, by the way, also then gets job security, helps everyone. That comes from a focus group. That wasn't our idea. It was the idea of the participants saying, well, I'm in grade 9, I've got an EA, now I'm in grade 10, I've got a different EA, and I'm in grade 11, I've got another one, I've got to train one every year, or maybe even more frequently, that, is, that makes no sense. Why does it, but that's the funding, that's the funding structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, we'll have to cut it, because it's 1 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank